welcome everyone, uh, whether you're in the, the UK watching this with a sandwich over lunch, uh, or it's late in the afternoon in the Middle East, or first thing in the USA, or even if you are extremely keen and you're in the middle of the night in Oceania, um, or more wisely catching up on the recording at a later date, at a more convenient time, a very warm welcome to all of you. Uh, as a way of introduction, I'm Rupert. I'm from Safe 365. Uh, as, a, as a mini introduction to Safe 365, technology company, uh, we help organizations create proactive risk environments. And ultimately, we believe that culture is the, at the heart of, of any business transformation. Um, how do we do this? We measure, we create visibility, we generate insights that then inform safety and well being culture change. Uh, and then we give organizations the tools to track benchmark and continuously improve culture over time. Um, today, we are particularly interested and well, for the last uh, few years, we've been particularly interested in the incredible progress that's been happening um, over the last decade or so in safety culture in airports and aviation, which is why today we brought together three key leaders for all from prominent organizations operating in this space. I'll let them introduce themselves properly in a moment. But today we've got, first of all, Amanda Owen, who is the Health, Safety and Wellbeing Director at Heathrow Airport. We've got Liam Simpson, the Director of Health, Safety and Wellbeing at Wilson James. And then we've got Russell Pink, the United Airlines Corporate Operations Safety Manager UK and co-lead Corporate Safety Innovations, who also wins the prize of the longest titles. Congre title congratulations, <laughs> Russell. Uh, before, I, before we probably get into this webinar, into the, um, into the substance of, of today, I wanted to quickly do a, uh, a plug or highlight an event that we've got coming up on the 9th of October. It is the Airports and the Aviation Summit 2024. What is it, you ask? It's an invite-only event for senior health, safety, and well-being leaders, hosted by the great Gerard Fallin, uh, King's Council, held at the uh, Royal Aeronautical Society, which I'm told is is a beautiful location. I think, Amanda, you, you mentioned that it's uh, quite stunning. Um, I'm imagining a lot of sort of intricate stonework, mahogany, dark maroon carpets, sort of hushed voices and everyone on their best behavior. That's the sort of the framing that I'm imagining for the day. So <laughs> we'll see what happens. <laughs> um, so the, just to give you a bit more information about that session, the session will examine the evolving relationship between safety and psychosocial risk as airports have ramped up post COVID. So we'll, we'll hear from airports themselves and their suppliers about measuring safety culture, um, the insights that have been generated, uh, how these insights then can secure investment from boards and executives. Uh, we'll hear about developing an insight-led well-being strategy, uh, an examination of the impacts of culture measurement, plus plenty of opportunities to network with other leaders uh, to share best practice, challenges, learning. Um, so just to, to emphasize that's for safety and well-being leaders. So um, if you're connecting in here as a safety leader and you've got uh, well-being people in your organization that you think would be interested in that, please invite them. I think the details will be thrown into the chat at some point. Um, places are limited. Uh, it's a free event, but please email me if you'd like to join. Um, my email is rupert.ray at safe365global.com. Um, I think Kirsty's going to throw that into the chat as well. So please email me back uh, if you'd like to come along to that session. So without uh, any more uh, preamble, oh, there you go. There's, there's the email popping up on the screen. Perfect. Without any more preamble, let's get into the session itself. So the title or the description of this session is while the benefits of a strong safety culture in aviation are well established, our challenge as safety professionals is to help stakeholders fully understand the extent of the impact and the lasting value of collectively elevating safety culture. Easier said than done. The idea of gathering these three leaders here together today is to provide you with ultimately their frank assessment or their snapshot of where they're at on their safety culture journeys, uh, their challenges, their successes. And hopefully from this session, uh, you can leave feeling encouraged by what you've heard and you can use the insights in your own organization uh, as you go on that journey. Now, while each of these leaders have their, their own thing going on, they're all linked by the, the Heathrow ecosystem operating in this incredible, complex and ever evolving environment. So complex, in fact, that I fairly often get lost between terminals two and three. That's another story. <laughs> um, but they're, they're being connected by this re recent safety culture initiatives that have been launched by Amanda and her wonderful team at Heathrow uh, and supported by Safe365. So with this in mind, um, a good place to start is with Amanda. 
Um, but before I do that, just to mention that there is a live chat. So if you've got questions um, that pop up along the way, please feel free to ask them. Um, it's great if we can kind of have a rolling Q&A, even though there will be in the last 15 minutes, there'll be a proper Q&A at the end. Um, so feel free to chuck them in there. Now, uh, so Amanda, let's start, let's start with you. First of all, uh, do you want to just do a quick introduction to what you do? And then the, the second part of the question was, it's quite a, quite a kind of meaty question to start off with, is across your career, how have you seen attitudes and action change in regards to safety culture? Thanks, Rupert. Um, hello, everyone. So, uh, Amanda Owen, Safety, Health and Wellbeing Director of Heathrow. One of the wonderful things about my job is um, the vast majority of people around the world have heard of Heathrow Airport. Um, perhaps a few facts for you since they are very relevant to the context of safety. So, fourth busiest airport in the world, 82 million passengers a year on forecast to, uh, to travel through our airport. Um, 89,000 colleagues work at Heathrow. Uh, of which less than 10% work directly for Heathrow Airport Limited, uh, over 400 companies and over 1,500 uh, suppliers in our supply chain. So as Rupert said, a very, very complex ecosystem, not least we are the fifth biggest infrastructure program in the UK, spending £4 billion on renewing and building new assets. So very complicated. Uh, my job, I have a team of 35 uh, health, safety and wellbeing professionals uh, and together we enable and challenge the business to protect people and protect the business from harm but, um, and increasingly so maximise the business value from strong safety culture. Rupert, as you've said, actually uh, health and safety now is, um, is understood to be far more than protecting people from harm and, and businesses from harm. And I think actually that links nicely into the question that you've asked, which is over my career which spans about 25 years now, um, certainly 25 years ago and after Chernobyl, which really set the frame for safety culture and introduced the importance of human factors in safety culture and performance, the safety critical industries, including aviation um, and flight safety, certainly oil and gas construction, uh, moved towards um, safe culture, human factors, behaviours, attitudes, etc. I think less safety critical industries were still certainly in the 90s were still thinking about compliance and safety management systems and that's a really important place to start absolutely where would you start you start by making sure you're compliant you start by making sure that you've got a strong safety management system they are critical components and actually i was looking i found in my car for i don't know why it was there i found baa's 2002 to 2007 um, strategy. Uh, I was here, I've been here six years now. I was, I went away for 12 years, um, but I was at BAA for eight years before that. And I found the strategy and it made absolutely no reference to safety culture. It started to talk about involving colleagues, but, but in 2002, it made no reference. It was about standards. It was about management systems. It was about compliance, but no reference to safety culture. And I think that's the absolute shift. I think through uh, in, in our industry, what I've seen is then through the 2000s, late 2000s, absolute recognition of human factors involving colleagues through to where we are now, which is that we understand as an industry that safety culture is critical to ensuring that people go home safe and well every day. But it, it's also an enormous op opportunity to, to drive far more business value because the ingredients that to deliver a strong safety culture are the ingredients that deliver efficiency, productivity and sustainable business performance. So that's the shift that I've seen in my career. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, Amanda. Um, that's that's great. I'll, I'll, I'll shift straight to to Liam as a um, yeah, ju just could you provide us with a bit of an introduction in terms of what you do and and also a summary of where you are on your safety culture journey? Yeah, good. Uh, thanks, thanks, Rupert. Um, pleasure to be a part of the webinar session this afternoon, um, and to everyone listening live. Hello. Um, I won't sort of repeat my name because Rupert did a good job of that in terms of introduction. But for myself, I'm the um, Health, Safety, and Wellbeing Director at Wilson James. Um, I think everyone's guess we're part of the the large ecosystem, as Amanda rightly put it, at Heathrow. Um, Wilson James specialise in providing safe, secure. And sustainable solutions um, to a variety of industries 
mainly predominantly across the UK. That's including construction logistics, aviation, of course, and also security. Um, I'm deeply committed to advancing occupational safety and health across all our operations. And I think as a health and safety purpose for Wilson James, we are ultimately ensuring all our colleagues and the customers that we're serving to ensure that they go home safe and um, healthy at the end of every day. Um, in terms of myself, I'll give a quick snapshot of where sort of my background and my background started in the early 2000s. Um, I joined the military, um, did a little bit, and I think that's where initially I started to realize my passion and, and sort of initial rooted for safety began. Um, I served a little over 10 years, left in 2013, um, and then really got my teeth stuck into safety in sort of 2014. Um, working in the manufacturing and servicing provider out in the Middle East. I did that for around six years uh, and then returned to um, the UK working for Wilson Jane in 2019 uh, and progressed for a number of roles until I was appointed in this role um, up to around 12, 12 months ago. Um, in terms of safety culture um, and our journey so far, I think it's been very progressive. A bit like Amanda, I think, you know, we've We've made them um, that transition from what was more traditional safety focused in terms of compliance driven um, to an approach where it's more proactive and risk based safety culture. And I think that shift has really been driven um, by our commitment to ensuring that our employees also feel empowered, um, but also taking responsibility as well for their safety and that of their own colleagues as well. Um, reflective. Um, we've got an ongoing evolution of safety, especially in this next generation over the, the coming years, and certainly seen a marked improvement, I think, in our safety metrics. Um, that's including sort of steady reduction within our incident rates, but also an increase in our near miss reporting and looking at them as more of a learning opportunity rather than the traditional methods of hazards and, and near misses. Um, and these improvements for me certainly indicate a shift in employee engagement and their vigilance to, you know, when it comes to safety and making that a real success for us moving forward. I think in term, it's notwithstanding, though, that, that we, you know, we've, we've certainly had um, a number of challenges. I think the evolving landscape where we find ourselves with work today, um, I think this is only ever going to become more challenges as we go on. Um, and I think for that, we have to be ready. Um, I think one of the biggest hurdles we might face, I guess, and this might be similar to, more, to a lot of organisations, I think is consistency in safety practices, especially with the dynamic and diverse working operations that we've got going on. Um, it certainly brings its own set of unique challenges and risks with that. But I think as we look forward, I think we have a main focus to reinforcing culture through continuous improvement, I think is key. Um, and ensuring that sort of we share that responsibility at all levels of the organisation. And that's exactly why, you know, we've partnered with the likes of, say, 365 and Heathrow, uh, because we really think that opens up the good opportunity for continued improvement. Brilliant. Thank, thanks, Liam. And um, throw it over to, to Russell. So, Russell, yeah, what do you do? Where are you on your on your safety culture journey? Yeah, thanks, Russell. Yeah, thanks. And uh, thank you for... Um, giving me the the full title length. Um, I know it is a long one. Um, so as you mentioned at the start of the call, I do sit within the uh, the corporate safety level. Um, and uh, one of the questions I always get uh, is how does that differ from kind of operational safety? And really, it's um, it's a role where I act more as a consultant and more as a a support uh, member of staff um, as opposed to being kind of feet on the ground in the operation every single day, which is a what I have done in previous roles. So it's very interesting. I get to see things from a kind of a, a higher viewpoint in terms of program oversight and all the safety programs that we manage at United. Um, so it's it's a, it's an interesting role. Um, it's, it's kind of key in terms of driving that safety culture message throughout the organization, not just in one area or not just with one group of, uh, of people. Um, so that's that's kind of what I do. Um, you also mentioned I, I co-lead the innovations team. So I'll come on to a little bit more about that uh, further into the call today. Um, but obviously, it's, it's really interesting getting to deal with new ways of working, new technologies uh, that are, are all there with the, with the aim to try and improve safety culture, try and decrease harm to our workforce, to our customers. Um, so that's that's 
kind of me from 35,000 feet. Um, in terms of United, I know um, Amanda gave some context behind like the size of Heathrow and how you know the operation works there. I'll do the same for United Airlines. Um, we are a very large organization, which I'm sure comes as no surprise to anybody on here. We do have over 100,000 employees. Um, uh, we operate every continent. We operate uh, hundreds and hundreds of aircraft um, flying tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of passengers every single day. So we are very large. And with that comes levels of complexity when it comes to safety culture and, and safety management. Um, where we are on our journey, I would say, it, it definitely differs where you are within the business. With an organization that large, it is hard to measure, to quantify safety culture in one short, uh, succinct kind of sentence. What I will say is that we are continuously learning, continuously improving our methods of measuring and our methods of reporting and recording where we are on a safety culture level. Um, and I will say from a leadership perspective, uh, and that's kind of senior execs down to kind of middle management, is that the messaging is consistent. It has not always been, and I'm sure every organization will, will empathize with that. Sometimes the messaging is inconsistent. Sometimes it's very tricky to, to take the entire village uh, with you on that journey. Um, and obviously United is more of a, a, a medium-sized city um, in terms of groups of people. But to try and start any culture, you need to get a village to come with you. You need to get a small group of people to come with you on that journey. There are a few exceptions in, in history. You know, you think of your Steve Jobs and people like that who can kind of change the culture of an organization, you know, very much by themselves and, and their, their very steadfast direction. But at United, I've said that we are starting that journey as a group. It's led by our senior executives and the messaging is consistent. Um, so... Yeah, I think I think we have a healthy culture throughout the organization, but it does differ on a micro scale. Wherever you go throughout the organization, you will see very healthy safety culture and you'll see challenges as well. Um, and I'll, again, I'll come on to that a bit more. I think one of the biggest successes that we've had as an organization is finding a way of actually measuring and incentivizing the improvement of safety culture. And I'm going to build a lot of my answers today around the framework of a program called Safety Excellence, which is what United operates around. So you'll hear me mention Safety Excellence on probably a number of occasions, but very high level, it's it's essentially built like a hotel loyalty scheme. You've got silver, gold, platinum. Um, and to reach each one, on each one of those levels, you need to be able to prove that you have done something um, in, in terms of improving your safety culture. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. Um, but you know, like what Amanda and Liam have already said, I think the biggest challenge is it, it's around that collaboration. It's around that getting people on the journey with you, with safety culture, um, strengthening their understanding of why we do what we do. Um, I think some people sometimes look at safety management and, and, and there's a lot of questions around it. Um, so that's probably one of the biggest challenges is colleague engagement and just making sure that you've got the buy-in from everybody. That, thanks, Russell. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll come back to that theme, um, you know, looking at how that safety culture journey has sort of differed between US and UK operations. So we'll, we'll come back to you in a minute and looking forward to hearing more about that. Um, I'll roll back to Amanda. And um, we've got this, th this next question was um, really sort of setting a bit more of the scene around the work you've been doing at Heathrow. Um, so, you know, over the last couple of years, you've kicked off significant safety culture projects across the ecosystem. Um, and this is, yeah, this is a, a two-part question. So firstly, uh, why has measuring and improving safety culture become such a, an imperative for you? And then the second part of that is from, from that measurement and improving process, what were the key insights for you and Team Heathrow that have come out of the project? And how are these um, helping to set the direction and the focus for your safety efforts? It's always fun being asked a question with sort of multiple parts. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thanks, Robert. Well, um, everyone on this call that's involved in aviation in any way will understand completely the devastating impact that COVID had on our industry. Um, and in particular, the number of people that left our industry as a result of, of that impact. And we lost a huge amount of experienced colleagues who left for whatever reasons. Um, and so we went through 18 months, two years of, of having hardly any passengers at all. And then as COVID was over, 
we have ramped up, up, back up as an industry to passenger numbers that actually exceed 2019. And, and, and obviously that's a very nice problem to have. But as we emerge from COVID, and I was talking to our chief operating officer, so to Russell's point, absolutely leadership from the from the very most senior execs in the organisation. She too was concerned that as we ramp back up through those different dynamics and lots of experience, um, that we might see an increase in harm rates and, and that uh, was not going to happen on her watch. So we, we had a conversation about that and, and what do we what do we do about that then? Well, one of the good things about COVID is actually it brought the community together in a way that we hadn't worked together before in absolute collaboration through COVID. Um, and that was a very positive thing. So to continue to harness the collaboration across safety that we'd seen through COVID to drive our safety culture together across this complex ecosystem, because we can only be safe together. Um, and secondly, then, if we're going to do that, then where do we start? Well, start by understanding where we are now across that ecosystem. And that's why Emma invited operational leaders from across Team Heathrow to come and have a conversation around that. And she invited them to measure using an approach that we could all buy into and a systematic approach, which, which um, has been powered by Safe 365. So firstly, really, we, we wanted to understand the, the differing cultures, as Russell said, through an organisation, you'll have different in cultures. Through an ecosystem, you'll have differing cultures because we're dependent on each other for safety. And really importantly, and what I really like about what Russell's doing and this incentivization is making the focus on improvement really positive. Make it safe to measure because we're not interested in the score. There isn't a bad score. There's only a starting score number, index, whatever we want to call it. What's really important is organisations, uh, and we're all honest with ourselves about where we are, and then actually commit to improving. So it enables, measurement enables improving improvement by helping understand where to focus, and certainly our measurement has helped us do that. And, you know, there's themes coming out of this conversation, aren't there? Actually, as, as within Russell's organisation, United, they're learning from each other, there's some fantastic practices across Team Heathrow, absolutely exceptional practices. And safety people, one of the great things about us as a profession is we are really willing to share. There's, there's no competitive advantage in safety. So what can, what can we learn from each other? And so for all of those reasons, we have embarked on a journey of measurement. Uh, the first round being a very simple approach and then moving into a more sophisticated approach using a system, using the Say365 system that not only measures, but also can help organisations improve and see how that improvement is leading to a reduction in harm. Um, and it's early days for us. Uh, it is early days. We're, we're just on our third round of measurement now. But between the first and second round of me measurement, we saw an increase in safety culture index scores and we saw a reduction in harm. We, we saw what we would expect to see. We also saw a lot of variability. Um, there are some people absolutely leading the organisations, leading the way in terms of safety culture. And there are some organisations that are um, you know, further along in their journey, not as, not as far progressed in their journey, but actually have got the opportunity because the rising tide rises all boats. Thank, thanks, Amanda, Thank for, for setting that context. Um, I think you know, like a a good a good place to go now is actually over to Liam, and you know you you've set the context of the work you've been doing in Heathrow, and now moving over to Liam as a supplier uh, or a Heathrow partner operating within the eco ecosystem. So, Liam, like, how's your how's your experience been of those sort of safety culture initiatives that Amanda and her team have have uh, launched, and then that she's just spoken about? Um, you know, have you have you found that this experience has had like a, a an influential effect on Wilson James's broader approach to safety culture within the organisation? Um, yeah, sort of, again, another two part question for you. <laughs> yeah, no, thanks, thanks, Rupert. But uh, I think thank you, Amanda, for sort of setting the scene with the um, sort of an insightful reflection on the, the project so far, and as that continues to, to develop, I think firstly. It's a you know it's a fantastic tool. We sort of you you um, alluded to it that we started with something quite quite basic, and then we've developed into 
this sophisticated tool that is Safe365. And I think part with well, with Wilson James, I think we've been deeply involved in that um, journey from the start um, within the Heathrow ecosystem. I think our experience has both been transformative, um, but also highly you know instructive as well. Um, I think as a key supplier and partner of, of Heathrow, I think you touched on it there and, and so did Russell, the collaborative nature um, of these kind of initiatives, certainly the key success of what they can be. Um, I think the emphasis on making it safe to measure is a really key message, as you mentioned as well, Amanda, um, and it's enabled us as, as an organisation at Heathrow, but also wider as well to be open and, and have that honest participation. And I think when we're talking around safety, it's crucial um when we're dealing with something so critical as safety culture you mentioned it amanda around the bad score i think there's no the fact that there's no bad score whatsoever um just uh, rather focus on continuous improvement um that really resonated with us at wilson james and i think that also sets the tone as well for future growth um and the utilization of the safe 365 platform wider um across the wilson james organization I think the opportunity to to learn um, from other partners within the ecosystem has certainly been invaluable through the, the safety council sharing best best practices you mentioned it earlier i think we do that you know excellently um across the ecosystem at Heathrow, and it also enables wider um, acceleration of safety culture beyond the, the the ecosystem at Heathrow as well um, and the importance collaboration and sharing that learning really is reinforcing um, when it comes to safety, you said it as well, Amanda, we are ultimately stronger together. And um, that's really, really important. I think it's had a hugely positive um, impact on attitudes and behaviours at all levels of the operation at Heathrow. Um, and I think for us, naturally, that certainly improves our safety performance as well. Awesome. Th thanks, Liv. Um, just to keep the, the, the flow going, I'll, I'll come back to Amanda and then um, move on to Russell. Um, but so, you know, Amanda, just, you know, as Liam has mentioned, as you described, the, you know, the, the project has been, HITA has been highly reliant on getting um, not only cooperation, but also commitment from the supplier cohort operating in Heathrow. Um, and, you know, from at least from, from my experience working with Heathrow, I've seen a lot of, lot of evidence of work being done to create a culture that, uh, or a culture of trust that goes far beyond just contractual compliance and ultimately gives you know the, the project its best chance of succeeding um how, how from your view how have the supply chain partners um responded to the heathrow safety culture journey and that sort of instigation of measuring and improving culture heathrow wide um i would say broadly very positively um there's been a norm uh, a normal distribution of responses and perhaps unsurprisingly the organisations that are most committed to safety were the fastest to commit. So because um, strong safety culture looks like that constant unease and, and constant desire to improve, regardless of what strong numbers and harm numbers or low harm numbers, I should say, might be telling you. So, so uh, and perhaps unsurprisingly, colleagues on the call and their organisation very quick to join the party amongst others and then there was the sort of the majority which were curious and open and and um interested and participated and there were a few slow to the party there were a few that were slow um probably for various reasons um but at, when we played back the results at um emma's uh, our coo as as was uh second safety summit when we played back the results two things um which uh so this was for operational leaders but one of them had snuck in his head of health and safety and um as these results were being shared albeit anonymous anonymously um the managing director said to his head of health and safety um we should probably be involved in this and his head of health and safety said we are and he said, we should probably be doing a bit more of this. And she said, she said, she said, we are. And he said, hmm, I should probably be paying more attention to this. I've been paying too much attention to contract negotiations. So that was a gem of and are. 
and absolutely are. And there was one other organisation that was actually probably the slowest to the party. Um, and we had to push and cajole and, uh, and, and finally we got their results through. And actually in the same summit, one of their most senior, very senior leaders stood up and said, um, with much humility to a group of peers of very senior operation leaders said, this was hard for us. And um, they didn't mean hard as process. It was an incredibly easy process. What they meant was, this was hard. These results have been through our legal team before we've shared them with you. Um, however, it was hard because it, it made us hold the mirror up. And the fact that they stood up in front of chief operating officers, managing directors and said that, um, I, I couldn't have been more pleased, frankly, because it's, it's that type of engagement and honesty, frankly, honesty and humility that is going to cause the, the change that, that we need. Brilliant. Thank, thanks, Amanda. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that, uh, that these, these other two have, uh, have uh, been given the, the green tick of approval in terms of their, <laughs> their engagement with the project. Otherwise, that could have been very awkward. Um, I, will, I want to just uh, change direction a little bit and um, focus on the, yeah, the, the impacts of raising safety culture, first of all, for Russell and then Liam. Um, so, yeah, Russell, like, what, what have, the question is, what have um, been the biggest impacts of raising safety culture for United Airlines? And I think the bit that I'm really interested in is how has the safety culture journeyed journey differed between US and UK operations? Have the same inputs produced different results across the two countries? Oh, sorry, we can't. Russell, we can't hear you. Still no? Still oh, yes, we can. We can hear you now. You can hear me now? Yep. OK. Yep. Um, so yeah, I'll break it down into the two parts of that question. So the, the biggest impact for for raising the biggest impact of raising safety culture at United Airlines, and I'll, again, I'll, I'll frame this answer around the safety excellence program that we that we operate. You know, when you walk into a station or into a work group with uh, a, a positive, healthy safety culture that is on that safety excellence journey you physically see and you physically hear the difference versus walking into a, a an unhealthy um, a work area. You see things like the behaviors that suggest it's not just safety that does safety. And we hear that in, in, in other areas that, oh, it's so safety related, oh, safety management will take care of that. The safety officer will take care of that. That doesn't happen in, in, a, in a healthy safety culture. Everybody takes responsibility and everyone takes ownership for that. It could be a small action, it could be a tiny action, but you see people engaged, you see people reporting um, versus the turning of the blind eye, you know, the shrugging of the shoulders, well, that's not really my job, is it? Um, and that's the biggest difference you see. And you, you feel it, you just, it, it's, it's, it's not something you can necessarily measure, but you just know when you walk into somewhere um, with a healthy um, culture. And, and Amanda joined us on a, on a visit to one of our, um, one of our hubs in America that has got safety excellence to the highest standard. And they've even been recognized by the US regulators, OSHA as well. And it's the same thing you walk in and you just know by talking to people, mm -hmm. oh yeah, they've got this healthy culture. And it's not just a few people, it's 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 the vast majority of the work group. And you just know that they've they've done some fantastic work in, in, in cultivating that positive safety culture. What I will stress is that impacts of raising safety culture does not necessarily result in instant metrics and metrics are very often a lagging indicator so the reason we we don't actually include metrics in our in our first status level in safety excellence is because it can take quite some time especially in a larger organization it can take a lot of time for those metrics to catch up if you can prove that you are developing a healthy safety culture those metrics will follow there's no doubt, but it can take time. So don't base the actions purely on metrics such as LTIs, damage rates, or incident rates, all these things. They may continue for some time because it takes some time 
for that stuff to be ironed out of the organization. Um, so that's a, a key element that I would stress is that when you're looking at impacts of safety culture, don't just use metrics. It has to be qualitative as well as quantitative. It has to be through interviews, talking to people, just observing, observing human behaviors, observing practices. Um, compliance and metrics will, will give you some results later on, but it's not an immediacy um, in terms of uh, output and, and impact. Um, what I'll also say is that the biggest impact of raising a positive safety culture, you will see the quality of investigations, reports, incident responses, immediately they will improve. Once people are bought in and once people are thinking in that certain way, which we've seen in our stations with safety excellence, you see those quality of reports and investigations immediately improve. And that helps in turn bring the right solutions to incidents. And then that's when you'll start to see the turn of the tide in metrics. And I'll also say that um, an improved and a healthy safety culture actually helps bring others along the journey so if you can prove that you're doing that and if you can have the right kind of uh, tone of conversation tone of discussion others will join even those most steadfast opposers to any change in terms of safety management if they see the majority are actually turning the tide and they're doing something positive likely they will want to be a part of it you will always have some naysayers that's human nature but the likelihood is you will get the vast majority joining you on the journey if you have a positive one now to answer the second part of your question i'll keep it quite brief has there been a difference between us and uk operations with the same inputs funnily enough not as much as you might think and as people like to draw lines between countries and cultures and and you know the lines on the map the end of it all is that we're talking about safety culture which it can be described as a very humanistic theory and whether you're in Tokyo, whether you're in London, whether you're in Washington, D.C., or South America or Africa, human beings operate in very similar ways. Yes, there are differences. Yes, there are customs and there are language differences and, and everything else. But generally speaking, humans operate in very similar ways. And what we found is that as long as that message is consistent and as long as you have harmony between each layer of the organization, so from senior management to middle management to the so-called front line, as long as there is harmony and there's a long as a connection between those levels, you will get relatively similar outputs. If, on the other hand, there is any disconnect at any point within the organization or the messaging is inconsistent, then you will see differing outputs. So really I would stress that it's, it's not based on geography. It is not based on the local customs. It's based on the internal relationships that your organization has and how you manage those. That's that's probably what I would see is, is the biggest driving factor in terms of how outputs might differ. Yep. Brilliant, no, thank, thanks for that, uh, Russell. I'm keeping with the the same theme around uh, impacts um, and moving to Liam. Um, what I want to do is just ask you around, uh, more broadly speaking across Wilson James's operations, what have been the biggest impacts of raising safety culture for Wilson James, um, outside leaving aside the the Heathrow operations for a moment. Yeah, thanks, Russell. I think you know, similar to what Russell said, I think for me, it's you know, we we can focus on metrics, and I'll come on to that in a sec. But I think mindset is key. Um, I think if we get the mindset right in terms of you know and that colleague engagement, I think you then you start to view safety in a different way, uh, and we get rid of the set of rules that what safety used to be um, and we, we follow a more data, you know, more um, drive decision making rather than it just being a set of, set of rules. And I think that cultural shift that I mentioned earlier around naturally you'll see, uh, depending over a period of time, you'll naturally see safety performance from a lagging indicator improve. But I think one of the key metrics for us as an organisation and we look at our leading indicators, it's absolutely to that point that Russell mentioned around colleague engagement. And we frame it as a safety engagement where we're just having a safety conversation and that can be at any level within the organization and we've seen dramatic improvements in that over the last two or three years where we've we kind of put a focus on it um and similar to what russell's got as well with safety excellence in wilson james we have um, a time for safety campaign initiative you you was um, you joined us russell i think uh, uh, no sorry you joined us rupert at our time for safety day back in april and this initiative really underscores the importance really for 
people just to take time to assess the risk and make an informed decision before proceeding with any risk that we think or any task. Um, I think it's a simple but powerful reminder to people, to colleagues, um, that safety should never be compromised. I think by just you know, giving our team the time and the tools that they need, we've seen a, a significant improvement in just their overall safety awareness um, and the reduction of sort of hazard decision making that typically then would lead to an unsafe act. Um, and you know, part of that safety campaign and, and our six commitments that sort of are built into that is intervention and empowerment. And I think that's a real been a real pillar of success in raising safety culture throughout Wilson James. If we've encouraged um, with our with our employees to be you know speak up, take action if they need to. And I think just that word empowerment is a real wow factor in sort of breaking down those silos um, and the fear that people will, you know, will, will get consequences if they are to speak up. Um, and the, you know, with that overwhelmingly positive feedback on that. Um, and I've just, for me, I think, you know, it makes people feel confident and more supported with, with the ability to intervene if they feel necessary at whatever level. Brilliant, Thank, thanks, Liam. Just um, before I shift back to Russell, just a reminder, we've got a quick Q&A at the end. So if you've got any questions, feel free to um, stick them in the chat, whether you're watching on Riverside or on LinkedIn, um, throw them in the chat and we'll pick those up and ask our, our three uh, panel members today. Um, Russell, looking forward, uh, what, are, what are your future plans for continuing to, to evolve and strengthen um, the yeah you know the substantial work that United's already doing in in safety culture. Where where are those gaps for improvement um, from from your side? Uh, and you know, selfishly as a, as a tech company, we want to ask: Does technology play a significant role in your future safety culture development plans? What what does that look like? Have you sort of seen um, you know trends appearing already? Um, do you have any yeah thoughts for the future? Yeah, and just make sure you can hear me okay this time before I get going. We can. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. Okay, well, I'm going to start off that answer. Just a quick engagement with our live audience as well. So please feel free just to drop a one or two word answer into the chat. Um, and I'll ask Amanda and Liam and Rupert as well. But just one quick question around the technology aspect. If you had a robot that could do anything for you, what would what task would you give it? What task would it be that it could take off your everyday list um, uh, that, that it could do for you. So just drop your answers in. I'll continue to give my answer and then I'll come back and it'll all make sense. Um, but I think in terms of our, our current kind of future plans, it's really about that engagement piece. Um, the Safety Excellence Program is obviously great. It's up and running. It's already got lots of engagement and lots of membership for it. Um, but I think colleague engagement is, is, is the key area that we need to focus on. Because to Amanda's point at the very beginning of this webinar, we have a huge change in the workforce. So we also have, you know, people who have worked for United for 30, 40, even 50 years in some cases, which I'm always amazed by when I meet those people, I'm like, wow, you know, 50 years with, with one company, it's absolutely amazing. Um, and then you've got people who have just joined, who are fresh out of college, they they're brand new to the aviation industry. They're of a totally different generation. They may be 30 or 40 years younger than their peers. And I think the future for, for safety culture is, is knowing how do you engage with all of those different subsets of people, not just age wise and generation wise, but as I mentioned before, we have people all over the world, different customs, different cultures, uh, geographically and nationally. Um, and I think it's it's a it's a huge challenge to help land the message that the senior executive level um, really want to kind of you know drive home. So for us, for example, you know we're we're looking at trying to develop um, shorts reels, you know, to, to to get the safety message out because we know the younger generation and the new generation coming through that is how they actually digest information best. You don't want to stick them in a classroom for two hours you know, and people just get bored and, and they get sign blind and they become numb to the message. Whereas if you're drip feeding little bits of information here, there and everywhere, that's what we're looking at doing. But you're also having to maintain people who have been there for 50 years, you know, and, and getting them on that journey with you. And it doesn't always mean that they're 
bought into the company ethos, even if they've been there for that long. So it's keeping them engaged. It's it's keeping them infused with with making sure that they're doing things the right way, making sure they're doing things the safe way, um, and also making sure that any change management, because operations versus change management, it is never it's never a good mix. They, there's always a, a, a butting of heads with that. So however you want to instill change, you need to make sure that it's it's practical, that it's feasible, and that you speak and you bring the operation on board with it. Now, I'm just looking at a few of the answers that come up to my earlier question about what would the robot do for you? I'm seeing a lot of, kind of non-creative, repetitive elements of work, hanging up the washing, anything that's compliance-based. Yep, I, I completely, completely agree. You know, for me, it would be, you know, kind of, house cleaning it could be laundry based i've seen that everywhere else so to answer your question around technology rupert technology is absolutely key in what we do and and, and as as the lead of the innovations team for united uh, safety innovations team um the technology that we're looking at does form a part of our future but what i want to stress is that it does not replace the human everything that i'm looking at in terms of innovation and technology it is not a replacement for the human being safety culture relies on our brains being engaged and our brains being infused and the minute you try and replace or you automate to a level where you are anesthetizing the human being that's when we actually see incidents occurring because they forget the the task they forget how to actually operate because there's an assumption that the technology will do it for them so technology is key but we need to marry technology with human factors together in a way that keeps people's brains engaged keeps people's act, people active um, because what I'm seeing here is that nobody really wants a robot that will take away the creative side of their life. Nobody wants a robot that will take away the thought provoking elements or the bits that really get them passionate or enthused. So that's what we need to make sure we do. We need to make sure we use technology responsibly and sustainably while maintaining our 100,000 workforce, because that's not going to go away anytime soon and nor should we expect it to. So that's where technology sits in our future plans. Um, and thank you everybody for your, for your interesting answers. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks, Russell. Yeah, I think, I mean, you raise a really good point of just about the, the shifting way um, communicate or how communication is shifting um, continuously. Just when we think that we've sort of uh, arrived at the next next stage or evolution of it, there's there's another sudden change. Um, so, I mean, yeah, what, watch the space, particularly with, you know, AI uh, currently just developing so quickly at the moment, but then simultaneously the sort of the pushback against that and the, the discovery of its limitations and how that's influencing how we talk to our employees and, and um, ultimately create messaging within an organization. Just, um, you know, keeping, keeping on, the, on the future the future theme. Coming back to Amanda. Amanda, um, the question here is, what's your vision for for Heathrow uh, and also the, the broader aviation sector over the next five to 10 years? I mean, feel free to push that time frame out to 20 years if you'd like. Um, but yeah, what, what, are you, what are you eyeing up um, or what do you see coming? So yesterday, um, it was my boss's last executive safety moment before she leaves to go to the Royal Mount. And we wanted to make it special for her and for the exec. And so I invited Andrew Walston Home OBE to join us in person to talk about the safety culture journey in construction over the last 20 years. Andrew built Terminal 5. He's keen to say not single-handedly, handedly, but he built Terminal 5. And it was a pivotal moment in my career when I was in a room full of suppliers and contractors that he had brought together and he'd asked for the industry norms around this four billion pound build and he was told it was going to be a billion over budget a year late and five people will be killed and he said that is not happening none of that is happening on my watch um, and because of his leadership and his leadership team and bringing the community together to work collaboratively to find solutions together to achieve the common ground that we all want in this extraordinary industry that we have the privilege of working in the best customer service the best efficiency the best quality on time departures and safety he brought the industry together to set those new standards set the new norm that was the old norm set the new norm and i think there is there's definitely absolutely pockets of best practice in our industry 
but in 10 years' time, that as an industry, we bring our uncompromising standards from slight flight safety onto the ground, that we recognise that we are a safety critical in, uh, industry on the ground as we are in the sky, that our C-suite leaders absolutely see and believe that at the ingredients for safety are the ingredients for all the other business performance metrics that's, uh, that, that are important to us all. And as Russell absolutely said, we do that actually by um, by, by mobilising um, and get it and bringing together, our, bringing our people into the mix and hearing from them. As Andrew said yesterday, we want people here with their light bulbs on. We want them here contributing, making their best contribution, and they'll do that if they feel empowered, enabled, cared for, and listened to. And those combinations of ingredients in 10 years' time as we continue to strengthen them will deliver the extraordinary performance that our extraordinary industry deserves. That's, that's great, Amanda. I, I think uh, I, was, I was listening um, the, quite recently to, I mean, it's a very famous book, yeah, the Atomic Habits book, and that, that concept of yeah, making yeah, just small incremental changes that set um, you know, an organization or even an industry just on a, on a tangent that ends up being radically different um, in, in the future and letting time compound. Um, so yeah, that, that's great. Um, again, sticking with a similar theme, Liam, looking forward, what, what are your future plans um, for continuing to evolve and strengthen your safety culture um, across Wilson James? More broadly, uh, what does the future look like for safety culture at Wilson James? I'm not, we're not getting you currently. Um, yeah, I'm just struggling then to take myself off. Oh, you read that. Yeah, yeah, yeah nice. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm back. Um, yeah, I think Enjoy pretty much, you know, similar to similar to Russell, really. I think, you know, we absolutely recognise that, you know, the the world is changing. Um, I think there's just an, the an exciting area of focus for us is sort of the the integration of technology um, and how that can improve our safety practices. Certainly not, you know the safety relies on human interaction so the the aspect of removing individuals and replacing it with tech just doesn't feel right um but i think what we can do we can bring the, we can bring tech to the party that really um improves you know safety practices right on the front right at the front line um but it also then it will give the ability as well to create that sense of belonging for individuals and make them able as well to understand where the risks are immediately and take that immediate action, um, which I think could be really, really powerful. Um, I also think the use of data um, is increasingly important for me um, to make that a part of our safety strategies moving forward. Um, as we analyze, we can then sort of, we can make more informed and intelligent decisions at all levels of the organization, which I think is going to be a huge step forward. Um, and I think, you know, the approach to this, it also allows the leadership team um, to be more proactive um, in addressing emerging risks that we come, that, that, you know, that we face on a day to day basis. And then it enables us better to allocate resources as well, more effectively, um, not just, to, you know, at the, at the higher echelons of organizations, but also at the front line as well. And we can take data-driven decisions, um, impact them actions. And I think for me, that will just make, you know, individual safety much more fluid, um, but also productive as well. So I think them are the two key areas for me, it's sort of the emerging development of technology, how we use that in terms of wearables, but also leveraging the power of data as well and how we can use that to make better informed and intelligent decisions at all levels of organizations. Brilliant, Thank, thanks Liam. Um, just our, our, yeah, our last regular question, then we'll move on to a bit of a Q&A. Um, is, so Russell, is there currently a, a unified approach um, that the airlines uh, are using to collaborate across safety culture, and you know, do do you see potential in creating industry-specific ways of collaborating across safety culture? Um, yeah, what kind of impacts could these could these have? Sort of three questions in one. I'm 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 increasing <laughs> the, uh, the cadence. I'll try and I'll try and kind of bring them all together. Um, <laughs> Wouldn't we all love it if the aviation industry was standardized? You'd think by now, 
Uh, we've been flying aircraft around the world for commercial reasons for for you know a century or so, and, and it's it's amazing how many different ways of loading an aircraft, how many different acronyms we have for the same thing. You move airline between jobs, and it's just an impossible task to try and remember everything. So it would be lovely to have a universal <laughs> approach to things. Um, sure, we are getting better. I, th I think as an industry, I think we are getting better at it. You look at um, you look at groups such as Airlines for America, which is you know United a part of the big airlines, Delta, American, Hawaiian, Southwest, Alaskan, all part of uh, one group, and willing and willingness to share information there. You know, willingness to share what what are the hazards you're seeing, what are the risks you're seeing, um, and you can you can do that. And, and here in the UK, you have the CAA. We have the Ground Handling um, Operations Safety team as well, Ghost, and that that's that's a great platform as well. So I'm seeing it. It's it it takes a certain group of people to to live it though. So so I think there's a lot of effort. There's a lot of attention being put on trying to collaborate across airlines. It is totally dependent on the airlines and the people there willing to share, willing to kind of come together and collaborate in an industry that has obviously, like I said, for for decades now, it's been very secretive. It's been very competitive in every other front. So it's very difficult to try and break down those barriers and those silos, but I think we are doing it. And you see with every, sadly, with every incident that happens, be that a, a fatal air crash, be that a ground incident where someone is unfortunately, you know, killed or, or severely injured on the ground at an airport, you see post-incident, everybody coming together and saying, wow, that could have happened to us. How can we stop that from happening? And I think we need to make sure that it doesn't take a fatal incident it doesn't take that fatal accident or or, or you know a global you know occurrence to actually bring us together we should be doing it more regularly we should be doing it more easily um and i think we are getting better at it but i think as an industry we've struggled up to now that would be my honest and very candid answer <laughs> no I, I really appreciate that that's um that was great um and yeah yeah i think you know what one of the reasons why I really enjoy these session, sessions is just getting that kind of frank insight around these issues from um, from leaders like yourselves. Uh, just shifting us to the the Q and A session because I realise we're going a bit over time, but um, you know what webinar doesn't go a little bit over time? Uh, that's all part of it. Uh, we've got a, a question from uh, Melbourne Airport, and that question was: uh, What are your experiences in influencing operators and third parties within your ecosystem, such as ground handling agencies and contractors uh, to support and advance the journey towards a robust safety culture. Um, I mean, this is a uh, this is a, a question open to, to all three of you. I, I suspect that um, Amanda may want to, um, to to sort of tackle this one initially. Um, Amanda? Um, hopefully I've answered part of that in, in our experience of engaging with community. I think what measurement has told us is where the variability is. So that tells us where. The next question is why there's variability. And the third question then is what? What can we do to help those that are less mature on their journey um, improve and, and go faster and accelerate their, their improvements? And the insight that we've had from measurement has shown us that um, some organizations uh, need some help and want our help. So it gave us that understanding um, that we can step into other organisations and support in terms of health and safety advice and guidance. Now, some of you on the call as safety professionals may think, oof, you know, you're stepping over your uh, responsibilities and uh, any lawyers on the call might think, oh, you're stepping across your legal liabilities. However, Actually, we had that conversation at our board, at the full board. We had a half an hour conversation. We did a legal review and our board were absolutely supportive that if there's, a, if there's an incident at Heathrow, it's an incident at Heathrow. It's one of our 90,000 colleagues, 88,000 colleagues. It's at Heathrow. It's our reputation. And we absolutely will take the risk and responsibility of stepping beyond our legal responsibilities into organisations that need our help and want our help. And, and when we've seen that, I've got um, 
a very strong team of health and safety professionals. Some some organisations that operate at Heathrow, they don't have the, I was going to say benefit, but obviously all organisations should have competent health and safety advice, but, but they simply don't know what they need to do, particularly if they are uh, headquartered in a different geography that has a different legal system or mindset where compliance management systems. And so we have identified through our measurement and it's not just the measurement, is it? It's then engaging with those organisations around how can we help you? It's safe and we want to help you. Not it's not it's bad and we're going to penalise you. And I think that's the key difference. It's safe and we want to help you. Thanks, Amanda. Um, yeah, hopefully that's that's uh, sort of what what you are looking for in terms of that response. But uh, you know, always encouraging um, the the asker of that question to to link up with us afterwards because we can continue that discussion further. It's a it's a really it's a really juicy one. Um, the the next question I had that came through was um, this was so we're a heavily compliance focused organisation taking safety culture baby steps. Uh, in terms of incorporating safety culture into our organization's broader culture and growth strategy. Um, as the safety professional guiding the board in this transition, which components of safety culture would you focus on slash give the most attention to initially? Mm. Maybe I'll uh, throw it to R Russell or Liam. Yeah, I mean, it, Liam, if you're happy, I'll, I just want to throw a quick one in there. Um, so straight away, separate the compliance with the safety culture. So you mentioned your compliance heavy focus, separate it out because if, if all the board are doing is focusing on compliance and metrics, it, it, it will not necessarily result in the culture. And that goes back to what I said earlier on in the webinar. The, the, I, for us at United Airlines, the, the core component of our excellence program and of trying to drive forward safety culture is leadership engagement. Now, that's not just your C-suite execs, it's not just your senior management, but your leadership on a local level as well. So if, even if that's a, a ramp lead at an airport, if it's a supervisor in a warehouse, whatever level of leadership you have in your business, they must be engaged with what the aim of the organization is, and they also need to be engaged with the, the, the workforce as well and have that relationship a healthy one. Um, if, if you don't have that and all you have is strong compliance monitoring and everything else, the culture may never come. So you, you, the main focus for us is that leadership engagement. It's, it's the first step on our excellence program. If you cannot tick the box on leadership engagement and say that you've achieved that, the rest, it isn't really gonna happen in our eyes. Thank you. Yeah, I think Thanks, just to, yeah, to echo um, Russell's point, I think the two bits that come out of that for me, safety leadership, um, you know, and employee engagement, and we talked around them both throughout the webinar. I think the other two bits to add on that, it for me is education and training. Um, we have to we have to invest in our colleagues um, to you know continue to upskill their knowledge um, and awareness when it comes to safety. I think that's crucial, um, and I think for me, there's the evolution of risk management. Um, we can't just sit on our laurels um, and just rely on a, a risk assessment to be done once a year and reviewed periodically. I think they're, you know, they're a live document and they need to be continually reviewed by all levels of the, uh, of the organisation. It shouldn't rely on safety professionals to complete and compile a risk assessment, um, bringing it back to the Billy Basics. You know, um, it relies on everybody to have that shared responsibility in the operation. Uh, to make sure, as we, you know, Russell, I think, mentioned it earlier, we, yes, we have quantitative, but qualitative as well in terms of risk assessments is absolutely key. Amanda, did you have any anything to add to uh, to this one? I think there's uh, two of those points. I think the one I would say is tr build trust, because as we've all said, this is about our people giving their best and to give their best to us, they need to feel cared for and trusted, not in a paternalistic way, in an adult adult relationship, um, but to feel trusted. And one of the things we did um, about a year ago, perhaps slightly longer now, is we've set up a joint safety forum with our trade unions, and four times a year, um, some other safety leaders from Heathrow 
sit in a room with about 70 trade union reps from across Team Heathrow organisations. This idea was brought to us by our regional officer from Unite and um, uh, uh, borrowed uh, from Toronto. And we sit in a room with 70 safety reps and they tell us as the airport operator what we're seeing and feeling. Um, and they're not the easiest days of the year to sit there because we don't get everything right as an airport all of the time. However, we're taking action and they're seeing we're taking action when they're bringing us issues that haven't been resolved in their own organisations and we're building trust. There are many other ways to build trust. Um, fundamentally listening and then acting on what and what you've heard as a leader. So I think trust is absolutely key. Awesome. Thank you very much, um, Amanda, Russell, and Liam. I think, um, you know, in terms of time, we probably uh, we probably uh, pushed it uh, pretty far. Uh, so we'll, we'll wrap things up there. But yeah, once again, thank you very much for your time um, and your insight today. Uh, you know, your frank assessment of where you're at uh, as, as individuals, but also um, as organizations, your challenges and, and your successes. Um, yeah, it'd be great to, you know, with uh, all that chat of the future to come back um, with this trio in a, in a few years and sort of review, <laughs> review where we're at and uh, where our, our hypotheses have led us. Um, from, you know, from my side, it really energizes me and the, uh, the team at Safety Resource 5 when as safety leaders, your vision and your, your views um, align with what we're doing in the safety and well-being culture space. Uh, you know, Safe 365 was ultimately started because we we believe and now actually have just a whole load of data uh, to confirm that cultural transformation has a massive impact both on the humans in every organization and on the business performance. Um, you know, we, we work with uh, 10, 000, well, over 10,000 organizations and we know that this process starts best with measurement and generating data insights around an organization's strengths and then its areas for improvement. Um, and, and as with the Heathrow ecosystem uh, and all we've seen there, uh, we've, we've made this process scalable across organizations or supply chains or even like an entire in industry like aviation. Um, and then this measurement and an insights process uh, helps organizations to ultimately form continuous improvement frameworks and like a, a common language for stakeholders to, to understand and get behind culture change. Uh, and then and then ultimately what we do is then link this culture change to traditional harm metrics, which we've discussed quite a bit today, or things like insurance claims costs, business efficiency, or improved commercial performance. Uh, and you know, by doing this, we're, we're able to, to help organizations direct their energy towards factors that result in ultimately happier and safer people, which is what we're after. Uh, and then the, the more sort of business oriented better performance and, and thriving uh, organizations end of things. Um, but, you know, as we've uh, keeping in line with the sort of frank assessment of where we're at, all of that is said with the acknowledgement that for us uh, as an organization, it's been it's been a quite a quite a long journey in terms of, um, you know, tech companies and companies working in the aviation sector to get where we're at. We've, we've taken years to refine our methodology and, and technology to produce great results. Um, so, you know, in, in summary, if you found this conversation interesting, um, or if you'd like to know more about um, any of these three individuals, I'm sure they'll be uh, very open to having a chat. Uh, they're all very uh, friendly folk. Uh, but also, if you like to chat with us, uh, with Safe365, when we send out this recording, there'll be contact us links. Feel free to book in uh, a chat to discuss what we do as well. Uh, and then lastly, if you missed the start, oh yeah, there's my email up on the screen, Rupert, um, at safe365global.com. Um, also, just a yeah, reminder, if you missed the start, on the 9th of October, there's the Airports and Aviation Summit 2024. So there's an invite event for senior health and safety leaders hosted by Gerard Forlin, King's Council, held at the delightful Royal Aeronautical Society. Um, so if you're interested in that, please make sure that you uh, send me an email, rupert.ray at safe365global.com. Uh, and thank you, finally, to all of our participants and everyone watching. Hope you have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Rupert. Thank you, everybody.